moment uh, to look out to look out for one another and as well um, for your ability to look out for your colleagues and your students, as well as to remember uh, that each of us as individuals will have our own challenges uh, from day to day that we're navigating. And that sense of having that appreciation gives us a bit of the patience and a, a bit of the confidence of being able to support each other and as well as to be able to extend uh, that sense of, of empathy uh, to one another. Uh, so, uh, most of all then, what I'm trying to say, the important item is for all of us uh, to remember and to recognize um, each other's humanity, as well as that sense and that sense of shared mission and building camaraderie uh, amongst each other. I think another important lesson um, that we've learned along the way, um, and as well as to recognize uh, that in some senses, we miss the opportunities uh, for us to have those unscheduled connections and conversations and those moments that just happen. Uh, sometimes they just happen in passing. Sometimes they just happen um, because of meaningful uh, effort to reconnect. And so those moments where students uh, approaches a professor or an instructor um, after class just to ask for help and maybe to, to get a moment for mentorship as well. Or uh, that moment when a faculty member, an instructor, um, passes by um, one another in the hallway and share an interesting antidote about something that might have happened throughout the day in the classroom or at another time as well. I also think uh, that there are those moments where colleagues just stop by uh, in our workspace uh, to get a quick tip or to make a point. And again, those kinds of moments and that are spontaneous moments of connecting um, with one another. In some senses, we've missed much of that over the last uh, couple of years. But as we have this renewal in return to um, many of the campuses and we'll see individuals both physically as well as online, um, we have this opportunity to have those moments of reconnecting. And I think that we should really treasure them and really nurture them as well. Um, as we approach uh, the fall semester, I would encourage you as well uh, to have those uh, considerations of intentionally building space and opportunities uh, for reconnection and those points uh, to flourish as well. I would also really encourage you uh, to take a look at those moments where you can connect with individuals um, and to build community, whether it's digitally or face-to-face, -face, um, taking advantage of all those moments. Um, before I go too far though, I'd also uh, like to take this moment uh, to uh, recognize the incredible work uh, done by Heidi uh, and her colleagues in support of um, the Teaching and Learning Exchange, TLX. And it's an uh, incredible work done, um, as well as in organizing and hosting today's event. And I'd just like to take that moment to recognize her and her team as well. Um, as you know, the uh, TLX plays a pivotal role in supporting and connecting uh, the George Brown teaching and learning community. Events like today are evidence of how our commitment to teaching and learning and innovation and excellence uh, can be exhibited and can be nurtured as well. I'd also like to um, thank uh, the entire TLX team uh, for all uh, that you have done uh, to support our faculty and educators, uh, not just through uh, events like this, um, but as well throughout the entire year and that sense of commitment to excellence in teaching and learning um, is really something that's so fundamental uh, to George Brown College. I'd also like to thank uh, Evelyn Chang, as well as, as, well as, as uh, Chili Lung uh, for supporting this event. Um, and I can tell you, I've already been assisted on the technology front uh, just to be able to participate today as well. So I'd like to thank them for all the work that they do. Uh, you literally help um, and support in making today's event um, possible. And I'd like to thank you for um, all that incredible work um, that you've done um, over this extended period of time. Well, um, finally, what I'd also like to make mention is, um, as uh, noted before, this is the beginning of uh, the academic year. And along with it comes a lot of excitement and, and promise uh, for the future and for the kind of work um, that each of you do. And this is an opportunity to thank you as faculty members, um, as uh, educators, uh, as staff members, in fact, the entire George Brown community uh, for the work that's done. Uh, every day to inspire, to connect, 
and to support our students and to support the excellent work done across uh, the college as well. And in that, I think the TLX um, is uh, so fundamental to that work and to that success. Um, as we gather, um, I think that we really can put the mission statement uh, of the college uh, to work. And that is the idea of turning learning uh, into opportunity. And what better example uh, do we have than TLX uh, for doing that um, each and every day um, of your activities? So at this point, I'd like to, um, again, um, thank um, ID Marsh. Uh, for all of her work and the work of her team, as well as the opportunity for her to now uh, introduce the keynote speaker for today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Farron. Uh, you mentioned the work of the TLX team, and of course, I would like to echo my thanks to the team uh, for their organization in today's event, but also for the work they've been doing these past few weeks. Uh, with the new faculty academy, the contract faculty orientations, uh, visiting divisional meetings, and all the work that they've been doing to really help to welcome our faculty, both new and returning back to campus in the new school year. Uh, it's an exciting time in the TLX. In addition to our core team, we now have seven new TLX associates to provide more embedded support within the academic divisions. Uh, and we're also going to be having an educational technology team join, uh, join the TLX this fall as well. So, uh, lots to look forward to uh, uh, in, in the weeks ahead. And while all of those onboarding and training activities are, are really an important part of the work that we do, it's really days like this and th this morning's event that really make me excited about the work that we do. When we make time and space to really talk about teaching and learning as a community, explore what teaching excellence means to us individually and collectively, to understand what we can do to welcome connect with and support all of our learners and to really reinvigorate our passion for the work that we do and for the impact that it has on our students. So as the team was talking about the plan for today and what sort of theme we would like to uh, instill or, or talk about and reflect on, we thought a lot about what we've learned over the past two years about the very real need to form those meaningful human connections with our colleagues, with our students. Uh, and while many of us will be returning to campus this fall and by default then reconnecting with our students and with our with our faculty uh, we really wanted to capture the idea of connecting by design rather than by default so what i mean by that is we want to encourage you to think about the ways in which we can be intentional about making the time and the space for meaningful connections and that might be through our formal teaching and learning practices uh, but it also can happen through those equally meaningful moments that happen spontaneously in those liminal times and spaces uh, that that Dr. Farron referred to previously. And this might actually be even more critical knowing that some of our colleagues and students will continue to learn and work in the digital environment this semester. So we're really going to need to find ways to foster ongoing sense of connection that bridges the on-campus and the digital learning communities. And to help us facilitate that reflection and to energize our thinking, I am so thrilled to be introducing our keynote speaker this morning, Flower Darby. Flower is an internationally renowned keynote speaker, author, and educator. She's taught in higher ed for over 25 years in a range of subjects, and this is really a range, Flower, including uh, English, technology, leadership, dance, and Pilates. Uh, and she's a seasoned face-to-face -face and online educator. Uh, Flower applies learning science across the disciplines and helps others to do the same. She's the author, along with James Lang, of Small Teaching Online, Applying Learning Science in Online Classes, and she's a regular contributor to the Chronicle of Higher Education. Her newest book project is on emotion science and teaching with technology. Please join me in welcoming Flower Darby to George Brown College for what I'm sure will be a highly engaging conversation. Flower, over to you. Thank you so much, Heidi, for the warm welcome, and thank you for the privilege and the honor of joining you here for this exciting event today. It, it truly is my joy. And I would like to start by acknowledging that I live and work in land many known, or sorry, known to many as Missouri. Um, I recently relocated here. I took up a new role. So now I'm in Missouri. The land encompassed the homelands of tribal nations of the Nutachi, Jiwer, Wawazi, Ogapa, Chickasha, among others. And um, I really appreciated what you had to say earlier, Heidi, about uh, the opportunity to continue to learn and um, dive into histories and seek reconciliation as well. So thank you for that. Um, 
so yeah okay this is cool this is exciting i'm really happy to be here but you know what dr fearon already said it all i don't have anything new to add so i feel like we can log off and be done <laughs> just kidding <laughs> really truly i appreciated your remarks dr fearon thank you for setting the tone it's very clear to me that um you you're very in tune with the realities of today and so yes i'm going to be talking about these kinds of things as well just a word or two about housekeeping before we jump into the slides um, so we do, uh, in that spirit of inclusivity and access that Heidi mentioned earlier, I will be uh, reading the words on the slide. You'll be happy to know that there aren't very many words on my slide uh, slides, but I will read those words to make sure that we articulate them vocally so that if people um, might be doing something else or if they are um, paying attention to our interpreter, then we're not missing anything that's on those slides. During most of the presentation, I keep my eyes locked firmly on you, and that is a nonverbal immediacy cue that I would encourage you to think about as well. If you're meeting with your students, teaching or recording videos, make that strong eye contact with the camera because it helps the people on the other side feel like I'm looking at you and I am looking at you because I'm excited to be here with you. What that also means is that I don't follow what's happening in the chat while I'm presenting my slides. However, I encourage you to use it as a place to um, share ideas and ask questions and suggestions, uh, place suggestions there, if that's useful for you. Now, periodically throughout the talk, I will be asking you some very deliberate questions, and then I am going to turn my eyes to the chat and, and pay attention to what you're putting in there. So, uh, and then we will have a break, a couple of breaks throughout this morning in order to um, pause, reflect, check in, see if there are questions that have come in those kinds of things. And so you're welcome to put any questions into the chat box when you have them or to save them for those designated opportunities. Uh, I believe that the TLX team is going to help keep track of those questions as they come in as well. So with that, those are essentially my housekeeping uh, items. Let's go ahead and jump into the slides. I do have so much to share with you today, probably a little bit too much. So <laughs> I encourage you to, I'm just trying to move my window here. I encourage you to take notes if that's something that would be useful for you. I deliberately bring a lot of ideas and strategies because we're all different, uh, different people, different personalities, professional preferences, teaching different disciplines and different modalities. So as a result, I bring a lot of ideas, but I've been told it can feel a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. So don't feel overwhelmed. Uh, in the small teaching way, I'm going to encourage you to maybe take one or two ideas from today and see how you can implement it this fall, but maybe jot down some ideas that you might want to come back to later. So today, thank you, Laura. So today, um, we are going to talk about the importance of connecting, and this is the coolest thing. What synergy, right? When Heidi reached out and the team from TLX and said, hey, we're, we're doing this event on reconnecting by design, I went, what do you know? I have a new talk on the importance of connecting and how it's critical and how we kind of been missing this in the pandemic. So we're going to jump right in uh, to the talk, Wired for Connection, Promoting Student and Faculty Wellbeing and Success. To start, I want you to meet Flower Darby, learn a little bit more about who I am when I'm not in Zoom or in the classroom. Uh, this is my family. My husband, Tim, is an amazing partner and collaborator in my work. We have three teenage daughters, which is awesome, as you can imagine. When it's not a global pandemic, we love to travel overseas. There's a couple of pictures of us there in London. I would love to get up to your neck of the woods too someday. So I always love travel. And then in the bottom corner, you're going to see a picture of what Zoom learning looked like in my, in my house, not my class, in my house in 2020. That's a picture of two of my daughters uh, playing a game on the living room floor while they're also in Zoom class. And so this pandemic has really kind of opened my eyes and given me many new perspectives. I spent the last two years heavily involved in research and experience as well, talking with thousands of faculty members across the world, really. Um, and so I have these new insights and perspectives to share. But I also feel affirmed, even though small teaching online is only about asynchronous online teaching, because that's kind of all there was um, for the most part before the pandemic. I've definitely observed that the principles and concepts still apply no matter what a modality that we are teaching in, uh, certainly in person as well, I would say. So I wanna draw back the curtain. And I already did this once when I said to, you know, when I, I encouraged you to make that strong eye contact, I like to periodically pull the curtain back and let you see why I do what I do because I strive to model my practice. 
So this slide is a reminder to me to explain why I start off with an introduction and helping you to see who I am when I'm not in Zoom. And that is because it's something I highly recommend, especially if you are teaching in online spaces. Students have told us repeatedly that they struggle to connect with you, their instructor. And so uh, anything that we can do to help our students see us as real people is hugely important. Now you have to personalize this. You may not feel comfortable sharing the faces of your family members, that, that's fine. Uh, I would encourage you to do something. Maybe you show images of um, a favorite destination or your pets, everybody loves to see pets. Uh, maybe something depicting your favorite hobby. Uh, help your students and not just at the beginning, right? I have this slide here at the beginning and I encourage you on day one in week one to help your students get to know you. But throughout the term, I would encourage you to keep helping your students get to know you because the research shows that is critical for the all important connections that really predict academic persistence and success. So with that, I have an opening question for you and I would love for you to choose an emoji to respond to this because today we're talking about connections and belonging. So here's my question, ask yourself, what does it feel like when you're part of the group? I'm actually going to bring down the slides. And the reason I'm going to do that is to help me see your responses. You can put the emojis in the chat box or use the reactions uh, in your screen. OK, good. When we're part of the group, we feel happy. We feel good. <laughs> Love the emojis and the responses that are coming in. OK, good. Excellent. Well, I have a follow up question for you. One moment here. What does it feel like when you aren't? How does it feel when you don't feel like you're part of the group? Feel free to put an emoji or a word, <laughs> right? Not good, oh, I love the pleading emoji. Yeah, like you're left hanging, not good, not good, not good, right? Lonely, it's defeating, it's discouraging, and actually it uh, interferes with our ability to focus and learn, it actually interferes with our cognitive processes. So that's where we're going today is not, <laughs> I'm distracted by all these beautiful emojis that are coming in. We wanna make sure that our students feel part of the group. Connection and belonging go hand in hand. And as I just mentioned, they totally predict academic success. So it's not just about warm fuzzies and relationships, although I'll be talking more about that. It is about fostering equitable learning outcomes and empowering our students to be successful academically. So keep these questions in mind as we proceed. I do want to just dwell briefly, not for long, on what we've been through in the last few years. I believe that higher ed has been shaken to its core. We have never experienced the kind of disruption and upheaval that we have been through. And these disruptions are continuing. We've been disrupted too. You know, as Dr. Fearon even alluded to, even though we're excited and feeling energized, ready for the term ahead, we also are experiencing uncertainty. I already saw some of that coming in in the chat box when uh, people were saying, we're hoping for a great year with no interruptions. There is that degree of uncertainty. I would argue that based on our experiences of the last few years, we are exhausted. I was giving um, a similar talk in person and I was on the plane and the person who was seated across the aisle in one row behind me, he leaned over and tapped my shoulder and he said, I don't know what your talk is, but I really love that slide. <laughs> I think collectively as a society, we are tired and I believe we have forgotten how to be together. Hear me out on this. We know that the pandemic reduced empathy and civility. We saw increases in violent crime, uh, traffic deaths, um, all these kinds of things because we've kind of forgotten how to be together. And our students have too. As I mentioned earlier, I spent a lot of time talking with faculty like you. And here's the refrain that I keep on hearing. Our students have forgotten how to be students and they've kind of forgotten how to be in a social setting altogether. Now that's a broad generalization, but I do believe that we're in a, at a very unique point where we need to help our students learn to be together, whether it's in person or online. And so that's why I loved the theme of, of today's event because it is, it is time to reconnect. 
And given what we have all been through, I believe that um, that this takes some intentionality and maybe a little uh, different approach. I, I think about it this way. When we send our young children to preschool or kindergarten, uh, we spend a lot of time training them how to be in the classroom. We, we teach them how to stand in line and uh, what to do when they need to go to the bathroom and how to share toys. There's a lot of training and orienting that happens. You know, bear with me on this kind of analogy, but I think maybe we want to uh, give a little bit of time and space to helping our students connect with each other and with us. So a theoretical question this time, how can we support our students and ourselves? Well, I have an answer to share with you. These are my thoughts. During the pandemic, I came across this concept of collective effervescence. Now, this is so fun to say, you should try it. Collective effervescence, I had to practice that a lot. And what this is, it's a sociology, sociological term coined by Irving Goffman. No, I feel like that's the wrong guy. It was Emile Durkheim, pardon me, any sociologists in the room. He coined this idea and he, he refers to it as the synchrony that we feel when we are together, when we experience those spontaneous little connections that we've already been talking about. It, it energizes it, us, it, it makes us feel effervescence. And I came across this term in this article. There's a specific kind of joy that we've been missing in 2021 by well-known psychologist, Adam Grant. He argues, that in societies where we pursue happiness socially, that people are more likely, based on research, uh, to experience increased well being. But in societies where we do the opposite and pursue individual gain and advancement and happiness, people are likely, still more likely, to report a lower sense of well being. And you know, here in the United States, uh, we are well known for our rugged individualism. And so I do believe that this is an opportunity to think about how we can pursue happiness socially with our students and with each other. And you know how we do it. It's by connecting, caring, and contributing. It's by recognizing that we need, we are wired for connection, our brain. This is how we have been made, how we have been designed. We need other people, even if, we're introverts, I hear you. Maybe you don't need quite as much connecting as others, but we still are wired to feel that we belong. And there's a wonderful quote by Maya Angelou that I don't have word for word in front of me, but essentially she wrote, I long to be accepted for who I am. And that's what I'm talking about. We need to connect, we need to belong. And you know what else we need to realize? We are not brains on sticks and neither are our students. This is from a new book called Minding Bodies, and it's all about the physicality of learning. And uh, Susan Roth, the author, encourages us to remember that there's more to college life than just learning. We need to pay attention to the holistic well-being of our students and ourselves. Spoiler alert, I'm going to argue that when we do invest in our students' well-being, when we do pour out for them, it renews us in our own energy and joy and well-being. We're going to feel renewed. And I have some ideas about how we can do this in a sustainable way so that we're not just always giving, giving, giving. Um, stay tuned for how we're going to do that. We're going to be looking at some various scholars uh, to guide our approach here today. Um, the point that I just made is, um, Harry, is where I learned about this from Harriet Schwartz. This slide says, I see you, I care, you matter. She is the author of a book called Connected Teaching. And these words were in an April 2020 blog post, and she wrote it about authentic connections in an age of COVID online. And she said, this is what our students want to feel. This is what they want to sense from us. They want to hear, I see you, I care, you matter. And she argues, I just, I just previewed it a minute ago, I got it from um, Schwartz, she argues that when we invest in students' basic humanity, we feel renewed in our own. We'll also be looking briefly at concepts in this book, Relationship Rich Education. I love how the uh, title image kind of reminds me of you know, similar ideas to the uh, theme for today. It's about the importance of relationships in college and uh, the authors here, Felton and Lambert, they argue that it's about relationships. It is the critical factor for student success academically. 
And this has been shown to happen online too. It is about the relationships. And it's not just with faculty and with other students, it's also about relationships that we form with other folks on campus, even the groundskeeper and even the person who um, is behind the coffee counter. Uh, forming these relationships is critical to student success. We'll also be looking at the importance of belonging because we can't connect with other people if we don't feel like we belong. Really interesting book um, by Lisa Nunn that came out recently. I think it's 2020. I should have had that on the slide. She says that feeling a sense of belonging predicts academic achievement and success. It's not just about happiness and well being, it is about the learning. We'll also be looking at the work of um, D Brian Dewsbury. He cites research that um, says belonging predicts success more than GPA or SAT scores here in the States. Those are kind of standard approaches that we use to think about whether a student is going to be successful in college. And actually, based on the research, the uh, sense of belonging that students feel, whether they feel that they fit in with the group or not, is a better predictor of their success in the first two years of college. And he also draws our attention to the idea that students interpret cues as confirmation of whether they belong or not. So students of marginalized identities, um, students who may be looking around and feeling like, I don't know if college is for me, the first time they do poorly on a test or an exam, it's going to reinforce for them. Yeah, I was right, college is not for me. And that is not an inclusive approach. So today we're going to talk about uh, how we can extend belongingness to our students in a few different ways, social belonging, but also academic belonging, how we can help them feel that they are good enough for college and how we can support their success in that way. Because we know that connectedness boosts learning. This is very robust in the literature. And I would argue that belonging precedes connection. We cannot connect if we don't feel like we're part of the group. So today we're going to look at some strategies to promote that social belonging just on that person to person level. We'll be looking at strategies to promote academic belonging and also to promote our own well being because we can't extend belonging to students unless we are feeling well ourselves. I'm actually going to start with this one. I think it's important to make sure that um, we, we are doing well. So if you would join me in a super simple exercise that I have begun practicing over the last few years. I don't do it as many times or as often as I should, but just follow the instructions on the slide here that say to breathe in, hold, uh, exhale and hold. I'm going to take just a moment to do this myself. right? Doesn't that feel good? Let's do this a little bit more often in our day. So uh, a question, another hypothetical question that I have for you as you ask yourself, what is one self-care strategy that you're using? If you would like to put that into the chat box right now, something either you've done for a while or maybe something that's new during the pandemic, go for walks. Absolutely, Laz. Thank you so much. Walking meetings, that's exactly what Rock argues for in Minding Bodies is walking learning groups too. Exercise, daily meditation, swimming, going for long walks, sleep, daily runs with the puppy, walking, reading, exercise and fun activities, yoga, uh, sleep, so important. Spending time with my family, absolutely. I believe in uh, academia, especially, we have a little bit of an overworked culture and I believe we have to intentionally protect time to care for ourselves, doing art projects, eating well, taking some time to relax daily, even for 30 minutes. I'm so thrilled to see that you're doing some great things already. Biking, painting, yes, absolutely. Things that bring us joy. Gratitude journal, all right. I have just a few ideas to share with you. And then once I kind of get through this section, I am going to invite us to pause, reflect, and share any thoughts and conversation or questions. So here's my ideas for how we can protect our own time for our well-being. First of all, we do need to define and protect our boundaries. I have been guilty. In fact, I'm struggling to meet a deadline right now and um, I'm not defining and protecting my boundaries very well. It's a short season. So we need this reminder, right? It's a journey. We need to recognize the importance of protecting those boundaries. And one of the ways that we can do that with our students is to communicate our availability. 
um, partly we have such an instant gratification society and I've experienced that desire for a quick answer. So students might be expecting you to be available all the time to them. That's not sustainable. That's not good work-life balance, but let's go that extra step to let our students know when and how we are available to them. Let's encourage them to come to us, but let's also set realistic expectations. This could be something on your syllabus that says, that uh, you protect time over the weekend for family. So if they email you during the weekend, you'll respond to them on Monday. Uh, what I have found is that as long as we're telling our students when they can expect to hear from us, they're fine. You know, same thing with an assignment returning uh, time frame. Typically I return assignments within three days or one week, whatever it might be, just tell them. Um, and by the same token, because we are humans and life happens for us as well, if something unexpected comes up where you're not available in the way that you normally are, tell them that too. Send an announcement, send an email, let them know. You don't even have to go into detail necessarily. I need to be offline because of something unexpected. I will be back you know, by this date. So let's uh, engage in some proactive communication. But part of that is also that it's important to schedule strategically. So for example, in the online classes that I teach, I used to have deadlines on Sunday night. That's kind of uh, a standard practice in some ways. But what that meant is that my students would be working on their assignments on Sunday and guess what? I don't wanna be online on Sunday. So I moved my deadline to Monday, right? Because that means that students could finish or you know work on the assignment over the weekend. And if they felt confident, ready to submit, they could get it in. But if anybody still had questions, I was able to log in on Monday morning and respond to those questions and they still had time to submit. So think about strategic scheduling in terms of protecting your time as well. I have two more ideas and these are radical. So get ready. And after I share these ideas, uh, we'll turn to you and see what's on your mind. First, I would encourage us, I'm talking to me, I would encourage us to rest. I don't do this enough. You'll be amused to know that a number of years ago, I had to read a book to learn how to rest. And it was a good book. He, this author argues, um, that's the name of the, that's the title. He argues that we cannot keep pushing, 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 right? That our brains can't keep working, that we have to carve out time for productivity, but also carve out time for mind wandering in exactly the ways that we were talking about earlier, yoga, painting, walks, exercise, meditation, all of these things are ways to cause us to be more productive when it is time to work. He presents lots of case studies of really prolific people in history who like Charles Darwin is one example, who would only work for like two hours a day and then would spend the entire rest of the day walking, playing tennis, uh, painting. So, um, encouraging us to be intentional, to give ourselves permission. That's what it was for me. I had to give myself permission to log off, to stop working and to um, protect time to rest. And here's my last crazy idea. Get ready for it. Subtract. What can we stop doing? What can we take away in order to make time for the connections with our students in order to be available to them in order to foster relationships. There is a fascinating new study that just came out in June from Brian Dewsbury and colleagues who I introduced you to a few minutes ago. He, their study found in an introductory biology course, they reduced content by 35% in order to make room for relationship building connections and active learning and they found that students in those sections of reduced content did better academically in downstream courses. They knew the material better. So it's a radical idea and one that you'll have to noodle on for a little bit, maybe even think about with a curriculum committee. But I would encourage you as we prepare for fall to take a critical look at the syllabus and say, okay, is there anything here that maybe could go? And then of course, this is something to think about in your own personal life as well. There was a season during the pandemic when I had to step away from my usual volunteer commitments. I just had to do it. Um, I knew it wasn't gonna be permanent, but do think about what you can take off your plate, both personally and academically, in order to protect your well-being. And why are we going to do these things? Because we know that it is about the people in our classes and we cannot show up for them if we are depleted. So I invite us now to pause and reflect. 
thoughts and questions. I'm gonna, um, I am gonna pull down the slides again. Another reason I'm doing this, another pull back the curtain moment. The slides themselves kind of feel like a barrier, right? They, they put up a wall between us. So I pull down the slides whenever possible to give our eyes a rest. We also know that staring at slides in Zoom is even more fatiguing than just being in Zoom. So if you are teaching in Zoom or anything like that, I encourage you to be strategic about how you use slides as well. Okay, so thoughts and questions as you're reflecting, mind watering, watering, mind wandering does so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Laura. Other reflections at this time. Les, that's a, such a good question. The idea of subtracting is interesting, but can this compromise academic rigor? Sure. <laughs> I, I won't argue with you on that. The key is to be very intentional about how we do that. And it's also, rigor is a tricky word these days. During the pandemic, in the um, pursuit of empathy and flexibility, some of us pared back our syllabi a lot, and maybe too much. Maybe we need to you know, achieve that balance. We do not want to compromise rigor at all. That is not uh, what I'm advocating for. It's not equitable. It's not inclusive. It doesn't serve our students well if we lower our standards and pass them on to the next class where they're not adequately prepared. So we uphold rigor, we uphold our standards, and we take a critical eye to asking ourselves, is everything that's on my syllabus really necessary? For example, historians uh, have written about this as well. Do we really need to read all of these texts and all of these people? Um, so it's a, a question, quality or, or compromise. I mean, sorry, quality or quantity. Um, yeah, okay, good. So let's take this question uh, from Nicole. How do you suggest supporting students through new anxieties? Um, wow, I just keep getting distracted by, <laughs> by the things coming in. Let me start that one again. <clears throat> How do you suggest supporting students through new anxieties and coming back to campus? Yes. Well, uh, good question. I'm gonna answer this one and then I'm going to turn it back to um, the slides so that we don't shortchange um, that uh, opportunity. It's a nuanced question, um, Nicole. We, we see that we are not therapists. We are not mental health um, specialists. We are not trained in these ways. So I'm not proposing that we need to do those things. Of course, uh, the first thing that I would encourage us to do is to try to be more, a little bit more attentive to the students who are in front of us. Even if they're online, we need to sort of keep an eye in a way that maybe didn't you know, resonate with us before the pandemic. Of course, we want to be ready to refer students to uh, resources that are available at George Brown in terms of mental health support counseling. I know many, many dedicated and uh, compassionate instructors who have walked the students to the counseling office in order to make sure they get there safely. Um, but again, we have to kind of protect our own boundaries. So here's the critical piece that I think about in terms of supporting students who are dealing with anxiety. And the question that I ask myself is, what am I doing in my class that's either causing anxiety or reducing anxiety? We can only control what we're doing in our own classes. Doing things like offering some empathy, some flexibility on deadlines, as Dr. Farron said earlier, uh, these are ways that we can show our students that we are compassionate. But also things like demonstrating pedagogical caring. And what I mean by that is demonstrating through the decisions that you make in your class that you care about your students and want them to be successful. Here's an example. Provide really explicit instructions on exactly what you want students to do. So they're not facing an assignment or a project and going, what am I, I don't know, I, I feel, ah, right? That, that can happen. So um, thinking about reducing anxiety, um, even in minimizing negative emotions, to go back to the research that I'm working on for the new book, these are ways that I think are within our um, sort of purview to affect. Now, I see that there are um, some really good points and questions. Uh, and another question from Griffin as well. May I have permission to um, come back to Griffin's question? Heidi, would you go ahead and, and keep that one for later? Yep. I just, okay, super, thank you. And good conversation in the chat box, but I'm not gonna pause right now. Um, again, I encourage you all to uh, continue in that way. I'm gonna bring the slides back up. 
because I want to make sure that we have time to look at the strategies for both social and academic belonging. So this first one won't take me long. I definitely encourage you to help your students get to know you. We already talked about that a little bit earlier in the talk with um, showing them pictures of who you are when you're not in class. You can make an all about me video. And as I mentioned, then you want to carry this through uh, the whole class, right? It's not just something that happens on day one and week one. I also want to acknowledge that based on your identities and preferences, you're gonna experience this in different ways, right? Um, so there may be elements of yourself that you don't choose to share with your students. Maybe out of it's out of your comfort zone. Maybe it's not safe to do so. That's okay. I would encourage you to think about, is there a little bit more of yourself that you can let students get to know? Maybe you'd like to crack corny jokes in class. Uh, whatever it might be, be yourself. And um, to the extent that you feel comfortable and safe doing so, let your students get to see you as a real person because it really does make that difference academically. It's also very important to get to know your students. And we, we know this, but it can be hard to do, especially when we are feeling a little rusty on our um, some of our social skills. So I have one idea to share with you, something that I started doing last year in my online class. I call it Share One Photo. I have learned about this idea from a biology instructor in Wisconsin. And here's the thing, what you do in week one, is ask your students to go to their smartphone photo library. And it's not taking a new picture, it's go to the photo library on your phone, pick an image that is meaningful to you, put it into a Word document, and then write a few lines about why you choose to share this. Now, as I mentioned earlier, students get anxious when they're not sure what to do. So it's a great idea to model for our students. So I, I created this assignment and I put this photo in the assignment and I said, this is my family at Disneyland. This is where we like to go. Judge us if you will, but that's kind of what we like to do. We're all there on the Jungle Cruise, which is my favorite ride. I was really blown away by what my students chose to show me. I made this as an individual assignment. I think it would have been different if it were a discussion forum, but in that private uh, space, students sent me just pictures that were so poignant, pictures of their high school graduation, of themselves mentoring underrepresented youth in the community, of their extended family seated around the dinner table. And they would write things like, my family is everything to me. They're getting me through this degree. So I would encourage you to think about inviting students to share something about themselves. This is one idea to, um, that can help you do that. You can also look at things like first day info sheets or surveys that invite and keyword invite, not require students to share what they choose to with you. Um, now, I also understand like in this particular case, it took me only a few seconds to write back to every student as I was marking their submission complete. I've just wrote a few lines like, wow, I can just really see how important this is for you. Thank you for sharing that with me. It only takes a few seconds. If you have a larger enrollment, you may just need to tell your students, it might take me a few weeks to get back to all of you, but I will, because I want to know a little bit more about who you are. And then it's more than just you and your students. It's also important to help students get to know each other. As an example, in a small group work, whether it's an in-class activity or something that's happening outside of class, I would encourage you to coach them on some basic social um, elements before they're expected to work together. Uh, at least coach them to exchange names. If it's an extended project, maybe they exchange phone numbers so they can keep in touch that way. Um, I think we need to do that kind of coaching in terms of um, let's get to know each other. Maybe even you have a, a short icebreaker game, again, in small groups, or maybe you take a little bit of class time or module time to have those icebreakers. This is the kind of extra um, effort that I would argue that we need to do. And it's also about uh, structuring ongoing interactions with your students. Here's an example. In asynchronous online courses, it's very common to have an introductions discussion forum. If by chance you don't have that, I would encourage you to do that where people post a little bit about themselves, introduce themselves. But then oftentimes in asynchronous classes, that's all there is. There's no more. And so you don't really feel like you know the people that you're posting with. And if you've taught online and your online discussions feel stilted, well, this could be why. It's, it's hard to work with people when you don't know anything about them. So I would encourage you to create, again, carve out class and uh, module space, maybe because you've subtracted something, um, carve out some space for ongoing social interactions, icebreakers and getting to know you things. Even games, games that have nothing to do with your material are 
a great way to help your students feel more comfortable, feel like they belong and reduce anxiety as well. And then finally, I would encourage you to uh, add those supportive messages. Uh, for example, research has shown that even a note in the margin, let's say that you um, are grading a math test on paper and just adding a quick little note in the margin to say good effort or wow, great job or anything like that. You know, even a smiley face. I know that feels elementary, but wow, those things really help. Um, those kinds of comments when we're grading things online, um, certainly from like thinking about that coaching role, sending an announcement or starting class every once in a while with, wow, you guys are doing so much work. I'm really proud of how it's going here. Let's be intentional to um, do those kinds of things. And again, in a way that feels authentic to you. You can see what my personality is. I can't hide it, right? Uh, I'm, I'm the biggest cheerleader there is. But if that doesn't resonate with you, then you can't do it the Flower Derby way, right? You have to do it your way. So be authentic to yourself. Think about how you are able to be intentional to encourage your students as well. Now, I have one more um, opportunity just to check in a little bit. And I will turn my attention back to the chat. I feel like we may have time for the question that we saved earlier, but in the meantime, um, while we're getting ready for that question, <laughs> what has been most interesting? And I am trying to find um, Griffin's question, but it'd probably be easier if you just voice it, Heidi. Sure, yeah. It, so Griffin asked, uh, do you have good examples of people in post-secondary who've come together to advocate for the kinds of structural changes necessary to make this important way of working possible for especially uh, people who face more oppression and surveillance in the workplace? Yes, thank you. And Griffin, I see your comment in the chat box. Would you like to unmute and talk to me a little bit more about that? Sure. So uh, maybe I'll come on camera for a sec. Um, this is, I really appreciate this lens. This is a way that um, I also teach and I'm conscious for me when I promote rest and the reduction of things and I make more space as a white person, as a person with a PhD, as a person with a lot of structural power, that is accepted. I'm not facing significant surveillance in the workplace. I'm not being told. I can put it forward as a philosophy because in an educational institution that values whiteness over racialization, that values particular kinds of credentials, then I am seen as a legitimate subject there. Mm -hmm. And there mm -hmm. are, I know that I'm not facing the kinds of surveillance, the kinds of questioning from both students, but also from managers. And so I am wondering about examples, because it seems to me like this requires a real, a real structure in which these ways of working, these ways of being are supported, in which there's an understanding that the ability to work this way and to be open about it uh, doesn't necessarily have the same outcomes or effects depending right. on particularly under white supremacy, under colonialism, ableism, right. et cetera. Thank you. That really is very helpful and so sensitive. Thank you for sharing um, this important perspective and question. I don't. <laughs> I don't have a good example. I think you have um, raised, you know, awareness of, of the group. And, and I actually, you're, you're inviting me to pause and state explicitly that I know that many of my recommendations are going to land differently with different people based on their identities, that something um, that I recommend may be doable for a white person, for a PhD, for a tenured uh, instructor that may not be as doable uh, based on other identities you know, as well. So good reminder, thank you. I, I'm trying to work that in and I overlooked it this time. I just, the only thing I can say in terms of, no, I don't have a good example, but I do believe this conversation is increasing. Uh, thinking about our colleagues of color, for example, the additional emotional labor that we know that our colleagues of color experience and other identities as well, um, in terms of supporting students who may be turning to a professor who looks like them for support to navigate these systems and our structures, which were not designed to be inclusive. Our, our systems and structures were designed for elite white men. And so by definition, they exclude other identities and other population groups. 
So thinking about that emotional labor, if we are in a position of power, whether it's formal or informal within our departments, if we can advocate and co-conspire with our faculty members and colleagues of color and other identities um, and, and begin to work with them hand in hand for creating more space, for recognizing uh, these kinds of things. So, um, yeah, so <laughs> this is a big topic. That would be a whole, that would be a great topic for another workshop. I'm gonna leave it there for right now and thank you again for raising this. So with that, let's, um, let's come back to the, thank you for sharing your thoughts as well. Let's come back to some ideas about how we can help students feel like they belong academically, that they are cut out for college. What can we do in our classes, in our, in our syllabi, in our structures that help students feel uh, able and adequate to be successful? Well, first thing that I would recommend based on Lisa Nunn's work is to normalize academic challenge. We had a great moment earlier talking about rigor. We don't lower our standards, but here's what we can do. We can tell our students, hey, this is hard, but I know you can do it, you know, with, with effort and with perseverance, you're going to get there. That's that kind of coaching messaging that I was talking about. Admit to students that, um, you know, that this doesn't, it's not going to be easy, but it's worth the work. And think about the way that we talk with our students that um, sometimes we say things like, I know you did this in high school, but um, so this is just a review what that communicates is that you're excluding somebody who may not have reviewed that concept in high school based on lots of um, you know various reasons opportunity gaps comes to mind resource gaps so instead of saying i know this is a review for you let's say this may be a review for some of you but i want to make sure that we're all on the same page with this foundational concept before we move on that's what i mean when i think about normalizing academic challenge and by the same token very similar we want to normalize academic supports. It can be very challenging for students to take that step to go to the tutoring center, for example, or to come to see you in office hours. Um, let's, let's make this a normal thing, let's message. I was giving this uh, point to a group of faculty in California and somebody put in the chat box, she said, I tell my students that A students go to tutoring. So let's, let's message, let's encourage our students to take advantage of the supports that we offer to them. And let's also coach effective learning behaviors such that many students come to us not knowing what it takes to be successful academically at this level. This is back to the point of not lowering our standards and not reducing rigor, but let's also help our students know what study skills, what methods, what approaches are effective. Here's one example. Last year, I was observing an introductory statistics class in person as you know, statistics can be very overwhelming and daunting for folks who don't consider themselves a math person, although we're working with our students to not box themselves in like that and instead have that growth mindset. But here's something that this instructor did on the very first day. She said, I know that this may feel scary for many of you, but here's what I recommend. Get through the reading before class, even if it takes you a really long time, and even if you're not sure what uh, what you're reading, or even if you don't really know exactly what everything means, get through the reading, come to class, we'll work through it together, and then after class, I strongly encourage you to take one more hour and go back through the reading and make sure that all your gaps are kind of filled in or reinforce your learning, consolidate your learning by going back through the reading with pencil in hand and, um, you know, just making sure you're on uh, where you're at. And I thought that was such a great example of a simple thing that we can do to help our students know. Now, again, that was, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> that was an example of something that happened on the first day. And as I've been saying um, throughout the talk, I would recommend that, um, you know, that we continue to look for ways to offer reminders and strategies to our students. But you know, what I have found in my experience is that we might encourage students to do things, but are they actually going to do them is another question. And so I would encourage that we um, actually create assignments and activities based on learning science. Now, this might sound like it's going to contradict my earlier suggestion of subtracting things, but where, where I really want to go with this is to be um, intentional in the way that we structure what is in the syllabus and is what we have put there the most effective things that we can do to support student learning. So uh, when you 
create activities, tasks, assignments, and these kinds of things that are based on learning science, you're going to really increase the impact on student learning and behavior. So I have a few ideas and we're gonna dive in um, to some of these things if, if you're coming to the session later today. But here's a few ideas for things that we can think about doing based on learning science to maximize the potential for student learning. The evidence-based activities that I would recommend include that we activate prior knowledge. So this may be something very simple that you can do in a classroom conversation or a discussion board forum and say to your students, what do you already know about this phenomenon or this concept? And you can even be sort of even more conversational like that. I know a bio, I mean, than that, I know a biology professor who asks their students, for example, has anybody here ever broken a bone? What was that like? And then the, that question is tied to the day's topic and it just gets people thinking about their own experience. Also, when you ask it to the group, again, in a class or online, people can learn from the other people's experiences as well. You could have a discussion forum question that says, have you ever had um, a work experience where your supervisor was doing this? What was that like? So very conversational is I think a very a good way to do this idea. It relies on the idea that we um, extend, sorry, we learn, the way we learn is by relating to what we already know. So when we activate what we already know, we create more receptivity for new learning to stick and really take hold. I also would encourage us to consider doing this by way of maybe an ungraded quiz or survey. We certainly don't grade people on uh, activity or material that we haven't uh, provided or instructed. But I would encourage us to think about, um, you know, I want you to solve these three problems and kind of see if you can remember how to do it from, you know, when you may have experienced these uh, concepts before. Um, okay, so let's, I do see a question and I will come to that when we come to the, uh, the our remaining period for questions and conversation. Another evidence-based activity that I recommend is to provide a partial framework. And this is based on the idea that the way we learn also is by organizing information in our mind. We need to have a robust mental structure uh, so that we know how to retrieve the information when it's there. I love the analogy that Michelle Miller shares in her book, Minds Online. She talks about our long-term memory being like a huge closet. And as an expert, you have well-developed closet structures where you know how to get the information that you need at any given time in order to make the outfit that you're thinking of, but our students don't have those structures. They have endless capacity for storing information, but they don't have a good way to organize it so that they can get it back off the hanger when they need it. So what we can do is we can help students create those mental connections. You can't call the closet installation crew and have them install a structure. Students have to create those connections and that structure for themselves. A, a research proven way to do that is to provide a partial framework. And this can be something as simple as guided notes, a document that students fill out during class, for example, while they're in class, while they're in Zoom, while they're working through the module, a guided notes document, which is essentially just, you know, subheadings for the main topics, shows people where to note what they're learning, where to add questions, and you can encourage this and just you know, say that it's going to help them be more successful or you could require it and have them turn it in. Um, this could also take the form of partial PowerPoint slides of uh, you know, a flow chart, a table, a graphic organizer. I have a good biology friend who gives her students partial diagrams of cells and cell structures and students annotate while she lectures. So anything along that line to help students organize new information is going to be effective. And one last idea on evidence-based activities is to structure retrieval practice. This is based on the idea that we call the testing effect. When we quiz ourselves, we embed and deepen the learning. It's a, it's a proven way to uh, strengthen learning of new concepts. So as I mentioned earlier, let's coach that effective learning behavior and tell our students, hey, get some flashcards or get an app and quiz yourself on this material periodically but are they actually gonna do it? So I would encourage us to think about adding retrieval practice into our classes. Maybe they are weekly quizzes. Maybe it is a way of starting your class at the beginning of the period by saying, hey, 
what do you remember from the last time that we were together? You know, a lot of times we start class and we'd say, remember last time we did this and that. Well, ask your students instead. This could be a small group activity. You could say, turn to a neighbor and make a list of all the topics that we did last week. Um, you can also make this a closing activity. It only takes five minutes. Take a minute, jot down the key highlights. This could be an individual thing. They could turn in their paper as they're walking out of the room or submit something in Zoom in that way. This could be a great module closing activity as well. Give me a reflection, just a quick written or recorded list of what you're taking away from this module. It could be a group activity, all these kinds of things. So structuring that retrieval practice for our students will hopefully help them to see how you know, productive and supportive it is. And then maybe they will do that for their other classes as well. One last idea that I want to share with you before we wrap up and finish with a little more time for conversation. And that is when we think about extending belonging to our students, when we think about helping them to feel that they're in the right place at the right time, that George Brown is their place and we are their people, I would encourage you to share selected failures. Keyword selected, right? You don't have to, you don't have to go into detail. You, you wanna be sensitive here. But thinking about um, letting your students know that you've experienced setbacks too, and it didn't mean game over, right? Again, we know that one of the main reasons that we see inequities in learning outcomes and completion rates is that students have that sense, even coming in, that college is not for them. And then they interpret those cues as confirmation and they stop out or, or don't continue, right? So being willing to open up a little bit and be vulnerable with your students and say, you know what, when I, I remember when I was a student and this is something that happened in one of my classes and I was so tempted to give up, but I, I picked myself up, dusted myself off. Sharing some of that with students really can help them to internalize the idea that setbacks are inevitable. The question is, and the key is to how do we recover from those setbacks in order to move on? So in her book, Nunn describes um, something that I think is so fun, and you can Google this, not right now, but Google it later. It's called a CV of failure. So it's just basically a, a short document of jobs I did not get, scholarships that weren't awarded, projects that were not funded, <laughs> schools that rejected my application. You can kind of have fun with it. Again, you want to be selective, clearly, but um, helping your students to see that challenge and setback and failure are absolutely normal and part of the process, but they can overcome those challenges and you're there to support them in the way that they do that. So just one more reminder that as we are approaching the beginning of a new academic year, and I will tell you here on my campus, it feels good. It feels the best that it has felt in, in years, literally three years. We have, um, our classes started two weeks ago and it feels really good. People are out and about and those spontaneous connections are happening. Let's remember that it is about the people in our classes. It is about reconnecting with intentionality, whether it's in person or online. Let's extend that belongingness. Let's help students connect with each other and with us because that is how we're going to support their well-being and importantly, how we're going to support our own well-being as well. So I have one last question for you here. Again, I would encourage you to feel free to put this into the chat box if you, if you would be willing to. Based on what we have discussed today, what is one strategy you're thinking of implementing? Something you're thinking about doing Give people, oh, sharing the photos. Good. Ice breaking activities, weekly touch base with students to keep them on track, help like structure ways of helping students to get to know each other because college can be a lonely place. Getting things off your plate, introductory presentation about myself, um, sharing photos, partial framework that is so powerful and actually pretty simple, right? It doesn't take a lot of time and effort to create those partial frameworks. I have one last final, final question. <laughs> What are you gonna stop? I know we had some kind of robust discussion about this earlier today. Um, what might you to be able to take off your personal professional plate? 
With that, we will open it up to uh, further questions and discussion. Heidi, I'm going to rely on you as well here to, you know, just kind of help if I missed anything that you want us to come back to. And I think um, I'm comfortable with, I'm going to bring down the slides. I'm comfortable with inviting people to unmute if you would like to say something. If you prefer to do that in the chat box, that's okay as well. Um, thoughts, questions? Sure. So there was uh, there was a question a little bit earlier uh, from Liz asking if you could share some strategies to close gaps in prior knowledge. So if you have students sort of say everything that they know so far, right. but if there are gaps uh, in those pieces, any strategies? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I did see that. And of course, uh, it was not top of mind. So thank you. This is a really timely question, right? All over the media, we are hearing educators um, you know, thinking about um, the learning loss that students may have experienced. I literally saw a headline just this morning about um, student scores on math and science here in the States being the lowest that they've been in a long time. So gaps in previous knowledge have always existed, right? It wasn't something that started happening with the pandemic because our, student comes, our students come to us with unique histories, uh, various identities. And really what we want to do in our classes is that that history that they've experienced individually and their identities do not predict their academic success. What we want to do is to create classes that everybody has that opportunity to be successful, regardless of how they are walking into our class, not as brains as sticks, but as whole people who we really want to care about and support. So um, this is tricky, right? <laughs> because it's, a, it's an age old problem. We know that it leads to us teaching to the middle, right? Because we can't sit one-on-one -on -one with our individual students. There are people who are struggling, they're, probably, they're falling behind. There's people who are more ready for more challenge and we end up out of necessity kind of teaching to the middle. I would argue that a lot of what I suggested here today in terms of those learning science-based activities are going to help overcome or reduce gaps in prior knowledge. I certainly would again remind us of the importance of uh, normalizing academic supports in terms of encouraging folks to go to um, seek academic support in a way that they might just be nervous or intimidated by, just make it a very normal thing that college students do. Uh, and then of course, as your own um, time and energy allows you to do, if you can collate some ideas, some uh, resources, uh, some ways that students can practice or review material that they may have missed. I'm thinking about that statistics instructor that I mentioned a little while ago. She periodically throughout the class, I worked with her during the whole semester, and periodically throughout the class, she would go to YouTube and find um, videos that help people who needed a little extra support with these concepts. And what I really appreciated about that is Students may spend forever in somewhere like YouTube. There are good videos in there, really talented educators, smart people with recorded lectures and such, but students might not find the most effective resources. So even if you take a few minutes and say, here, I went through and here's a few videos or websites that you can go to, um, I think those would be ways to very practically speaking, help your students uh, immerse themselves in new concepts as well. Great. I've just been scanning through and I'm not sure that I see any other questions. Per Except se. I think one oh. just came in from oh, Les. Okay. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, I'll voice it. For years, we have spoken about underprepared students. How are the challenges today different? Are the challenges different? I do think that the challenges today are different. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about students uh, just having lost the ability to interact at a social level. And again, I know that's a broad generalization, but I would say that societally we have, we have lost some of those skills. So I do believe that it is, um, it's a different kind of level of preparation. And I see your good comment there, Daphne, about underprepared. Uh, maybe that is, a, that might reinforce deficit thinking. That is something that I have been working on in my own work is to move away from um, communicating in ways that reinforce deficit thinking. We know that each student comes to us with a tremendous amount of strengths and abilities and capacity potential um, that, they, that students come to us with vast cultural wealth, things that uh, they have learned from their communities things that we have all learned uh, and strengths that we bring. 
And so, yes, let's celebrate what our students are bringing. Each individual student has a unique history, has unique set of identities. And it's also, I think, okay to recognize that because of that unique history, students come to us with varying levels of preparation. I, I don't want to reinforce deficit thinking, but I, I do think that happens. And so um, in terms of academically, I don't necessarily see the challenge is any different than what we've been dealing with. I mean, let me, let me qualify that just for a minute. Yes, uh, academically, I think it's appropriate to question the quality of the educational experiences that our students had in during the pandemic, especially during the fully online times. But um, it's not a new problem that students come to us with with knowledge gaps. We, that's I don't think we can debate that. So I wouldn't say the challenges new are new academically. I would say perhaps socially, there are some different challenges that we're facing, and I think the very theme of today's event um, acknowledges that as well. So. If um, as we are, you know, wrapping up this time together, I encourage um, thoughts, suggestions, sharing of practices that you implement in your class that have been successful. Doesn't just have to be questions. Feel free to uh, put in the chat box, or if you would like to unmute, I think that's probably okay. Um, your own contributions as well. Um, okay, so I'm just looking at, um, and uh, so Nick says these are suggestions, use the term coaching throughout, can you say more about the, the role of faculty member as a coach versus a content expert? Great question, Nick. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I do that really deliberately, Nick, because I 100% believe, and maybe some of us here may not be in this mindset <laughs> today, but I do believe that we have an opportunity to be more than content experts with our students. I was talking with an advertising instructor a few years back and she said it, she said it great. She said, I don't see myself as only teaching content. I see myself as supporting the whole student. Brian Dewsbury says the same thing, supporting students' social and intellectual growth and teaching beyond the content, coaching in things that are going to benefit our students that are good life skills that are going to help them achieve their academic you know outcomes and that college credential that they are seeking in order to make a better life so this you know I don't expect that everybody would agree with me on this point but I absolutely believe that I might even go so far as to say we have a responsibility to the students in our classes to not be their best friends, not be their counselor their therapist not be available to them 24 7 I'm not saying that I'm saying within the role that we have as the um, as their instructor of looking for ways to message ideas, concepts, approaches that convey that we are supporting them, we're cheering them on, we're on the same side, we want them to be successful. That's how I would kind of think about that. And we have a question from Mandy. Uh, you mentioned early on the student who does not do well in an early assignment and is affirmed in not belonging. Agree this is a crucial time. Can you say more about helpful strategies that are specific to this? Absolutely. I have so many ideas on that. <laughs> um, and it's kind of a big concept uh, that we could, again, spend an hour on if we had the time. But essentially, there's a couple of things to think about here. First of all, I strongly encourage, as we are looking to teach more equity-focused classes and advance more equitable learning outcomes, I strongly encourage that we take a good hard look at our assessments, be it projects, papers, exams, whatever it might be, and see if we can increase equitable outcomes or foster more equitable outcomes through the way that we're assessing our students. Here's a classic example, a very traditional college class where the only thing that students get graded on are two major exams. If they bomb that first exam, game really is over. You can't recover from that. So one thing to think about in the design of your course and syllabus is to break up those major exams and you can create, for example, eight tests that are still just as rigorous and challenging. But if, student, if a student doesn't perform well on one of them or even you know, takes a couple of tests for them to recognize that they need to do things differently to be successful, again, it's not game over. So thinking about the structure and the frequency and the uh, amount of weight that we're providing in those assessments is the first way that I would consider this. 
And then the other thing, uh, again, especially with a focus on equity, I'm a big fan of offering retakes, redos, resubmissions, um, or another way to do this is to structure your grading scheme such that assessments early in the semester are worth less than the assessments later in the semester. So being very intentional in allowing our students to learn as they go, um, allowing them to learn from mistakes and resubmit or you know, submit test corrections with an explanation about what they did, um, where they went awry and what they're going to do differently next time. These are all ways that I would build in. And again, I'm, I totally hear you, that stuff takes time. So you have to take a good hard look on the amount of content that you're trying to cover. And that could be a departmental conversation, right? It could be a, a cross campus conversation about um, how we structure our syllabi and the material that we're trying to get students through. But building in some of that equity focused grading, um, again, messaging to students that your grade does not define you as a person. It does not define your capacity for potential and success. Um, some of those kinds of things combined with the structural ideas that I shared about retakes and such uh, could be a way of addressing, addressing those. That's terrific. That's the that's the last question I see. So if anyone this this is your last chance. If you if you have any other uh, additional questions, now's your moment. Uh, what I'm loving seeing also is so many colleagues sharing their own ideas and practices in the chat. And what a wealth of uh, information and knowledge is in there as well. So I hope you've also been having a chance, everybody, to to scroll through and see the brilliance that exists among our faculty yes. as well. Really great. Really nice to see. Uh, okay, uh, Juanita, we need to strike a balance between the number of assessments across the program and not just in one course, perhaps more formative assessments and opportunities to build more capstone assessments through lower stakes drafts. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. All right. Um, well, uh, barring any more last minute late edition questions, um, I, oh, oh, we got one, we got one. <laughs> Of course. Uh, where do you see the future of education going? So small question just to end it off <laughs> right. in terms of structure, in-person, online, and hybrid. And we'll make, maybe we'll make that the last question, but have at it, Flower. Yes, sure. Great question, um, Karen. Thank you. Um, it's more online. It is. The future of education is more online. Online is going to grow. Um, students are asking for it. We all collectively learned that uh, offering more remote and virtual opportunities increases access. And here's another direction that I see higher education beginning to go. <laughs> We're in the early stages of this, but I do believe there is a movement in higher education to advance equity and to support our students as people. And so that's where I'm saying the, the increase in online offerings is in step with our collective desire to be more inclusive, to welcome uh, populations who have historically been excluded and who are currently underrepresented in our, in our campuses. Um, because we want to support these um, all of our students and because we recognize that today's college students are different than the ones maybe even that we were. Um, we, colleges at that time, were more traditionally characterized by students who could afford and who had the luxury and the privilege of being full-time students. And today's college students, I, I call them the new majority, are much more likely to be working, to be managing family responsibilities, to be juggling multiple competing demands. And does that mean they don't deserve an equal chance to earn that college credential? No, it does not. These students are trying to make that better life for themselves. And I am a firm believer in the importance of a, an engaged citizenry who, you know, people who are able to think critically, to think for themselves, to respect difference, to engage in civil discourse. I think what's happening in the United States right now is a prime example of why we need to um, focus on educating our citizens and, and enabling them, empowering them to earn that college credential. So in the name of equity, which is a direction that I believe that higher ed is meaningfully trying to go, not, not just a buzzword, not just a, a passing fad. There are more online offerings being seen at institutions across North America. I'm hearing about some kind of iffy examples of colleges uh, here in the States who are offering like nine 
ways that you can attend like nine different modalities. And I'm like, oh boy, I'm not sure about that. But increase in hybrid, increase in uh, online synchronous, which wasn't really a thing before the pandemic, broadly speaking, increase or maintenance of asynchronous because that is the most flexible option, increase in interesting models. Let's come together for one weekend and then go off for the next month and do your work and then come back. That's not entirely new or innovative, but I do believe that people are going to be um, experimenting with how we take advantage of technology uh, in order to help our students be successful. Uh, that's fantastic, uh, and I think such a nice way of closing, uh, Flower. And uh, I just wanted to to take a moment to say thank you. Uh, first, my heartfelt uh, thank you to Flower for all of the insights that you've shared today. And you'll see there are many more kudos coming your way in the chat as well. Uh, what I'm taking away from today's talk, most of all, is the idea of modeling and the power of modeling for our, for our colleagues and for our students. Um, I was thinking about Griffin's question, how we make these kinds of practices safe for one another. And I know that a lot of senior leaders were actually uh, here at today's uh, session and a lot of vice presidents and our president. And I think that sometimes uh, modeling these practices and making it clear that this is something that matters to us as an institution is a big opportunity that we can all think about making space for um, setting those boundaries, for subtracting, for rest. Um, and so I think that's something we can all think about the impact of our own behaviors and the messages we're sending and, and how that can trickle through our culture um, as a college. Uh, but also uh, normalizing and modeling a lot of these other pieces. So uh, it is going to feel uncertain when we're back in a classroom. I know when we were at the New Faculty Academy last week, uh, it, we felt a little nervous too to be back in a classroom with faculty. And I think it's, a very, it's okay to say that to your students and to normalize those conversations around uncertainty and modeling failure uh, I think the CV of failure seemed to really resonate with my team, Flower, so maybe that's an activity that we'll do. Uh, but I want to thank you so much for sharing so many concrete strategies and ideas with our community today. It was really such a wonderful, energizing way to start off the school year. Uh, I know I'm feeling uh, invigorated and excited about the coming weeks and months together. Uh, so really want to thank you for, for being here and sharing all of your knowledge and expertise. Uh, I also want to extend a very sincere thank you to Monique LeDrew, who has been our interpreter for an entire hour and a half. That's a lot of long, intensive interpreting. And Monique, I cannot express my gratitude enough to you for being here. Really, thank you. Um, and finally, thank you to, um, the, to all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up for this conversation and, and contributing to the vibrant teaching and learning community that we have at George Brown. And uh, as you embark on the, the coming weeks and months with your students, with your colleagues, uh, I, I really want to express uh, my hope that you will, you will have a, a, a semester full of teaching that is filled with courage and with joy. Um, I wish you all the best. Thank you for being here and um, happy back to school. Have a great semester, everybody. Thank you again for having me. Be well. <laughs>